for interpreting or applying the provisions. Like for example, it says auditor is not supposed to render certain services with respect to a company or any party who is related to that company. When it comes to that particular segment, when you talk about relationship, that relationship would follow the Companies Act provision. But when it comes to AS18 accounting disclosures, obviously the existing disclosures should apply. This is going to have a significant impact. Similarly, from an accounting standard point of view, 21, 23 and 27, which deals with uh, control, subsidiary, associate, significant influence, all these would have serious implementation issues in terms of what should be done for accounting and what should be done for uh, compliance with the Act. But one view which is emerging is apply the provisions of Companies Act because if one has to do an harmonious interpretation, the view that is emerging is apply the principles of Companies Act for the purpose of identifying when you should consolidate. For example, Companies Act says for the term subsidiary, it means subsidiary includes associate and joint venture. So, if you have an associate, then you, you, you kind of move to the next stage, okay, I have to do consolidated. But when you come into consolidation, apply AS21 principles. So, conceptually keep this in mind, that is also a view which is possible. So, let us say I think theoretically if the regulator is not going to come up with any clarification or anything, then the view could be apply the provisions of Companies Act at the first level, do not get confused with what is there in the Companies Act, what is there in the accounting standard, just take the provisions as it is. Companies Act says if you have an associate consolidate, then do not worry about AS21, then come to AS21 and then whatever AS21 says you do that. So, that is also something which is possible. Moving on to auditing standards. Now, this is something which is very, very important as I was just mentioning. For the first time, the Act gives legal recognition for auditing standards. Why this is happening is obviously because of uh, the, the, the credibility attached to the profession. Let us say, I think when the various stakeholders expect more and more from the auditors, then the gap gets widened. So, either the expectations need to be changed or the profession needs to be geared for meeting those expectations. But if you look at it from a regulator's point of view, there is no choice. In fact, I always used to talk about this. When I chose this profession as an auditor, I was thinking I am going to deal with debits and credits accounts, that is it, books of accounts. But I never thought I am going to be doing a big forensic investigation like a CID when I am talking to somebody whether he is defrauding, whether he is kind of cheating something, is he kind of hiding something. That was not my profession. But now if you look at it globally, the profession is also changing. So, I am also supposed to look into those aspects. So, there is an auditing standard which talks about auditors roles and responsibilities in terms of frauds and other things. But this is going to be the big issue going forward because the stakeholders will have more and more expectations from the uh, audit professionals. But the real issue is whether auditors are capable of meeting those expectations which is beyond their expertise. That is going to be a big issue. Now, the way in which actually the corporates are growing, the, the business situations are changing. Uh, in fact, uh, when, I, when I went to US, actually the first training that was given to me was a forensic training where the, some FBI officials, they came and then they took some training about uh, um, how to do a forensic audit. They were talking about when you are talking to somebody, you should observe how they are talking. Look at their uh, behavioral patterns, look at their body language. Why should I get into all this? Just imagine, just sit back and think, I am a plain vanilla auditor, right? But the, the need of the hour, so the, the society has changed, expectations have changed. So, if you just sit back for a minute, probably you, you, you may be thinking, oh, we have come a long way. But when the stakeholder's expectations get changed, you have to change. So, we have to equip ourselves. That is why you will see now forensic audit has become a, a thrust area in the audit itself. And now, with the Companies Act, the new reporting requirements, in fact, the reason why I want to touch upon this is auditing standards are absolutely, absolutely important. To a certain extent, let us say, the standard on auditing talks about the roles and responsibilities of an auditor for fraud reporting, how to deal with aspects of property, how to deal with related party transactions. There are standards that are available. But the real issue is, now the Act is expecting more and more. So, what do you do? You have to necessarily, now that has become a supreme authority. So, the standards need to change and that needs to actually provide a platform for professionals for executing what is expected flawlessly. 
Now, there are three major things that are relevant uh, as far as auditing is concerned and also from a reporting point of view. In addition to whatever is being reported currently, auditors are required to comment about any observations or comments on financial transactions or matters which could have an adverse effect on the functioning of the company. For the first time, if you look at it, the Companies Act talks about auditor's responsibility at a transaction level. As auditors, you talk about your opinion on the financial statement. You don't get into transactions. But now, that has been lifted. So then that means, one interpretation could be, you have to get into something like a propriety audit. Like what CNAG is doing, probably that could be the ambit. I mean, one has to wait and watch in terms of how all these provisions shape up. But uh, if one has to literally go by transactions, how will you comment about a material transaction without knowing the Im entire impact in totality? So this is going to be very, very significant from the audit point of view. The next one is any qualification, reservation or adverse remark on the maintenance of books of accounts. How do you maintain books of accounts? If there are any negative comments, that need to be addressed separately. The third one, which is very, very important. Companies Act, in addition to the normal financial reporting, introduces for the first time the concept of internal control evaluation. What is internal control evaluation? This is something which is similar to SOX, the Sarbanes requirement uh, in the US. And uh, probably we have to wait for the framework uh, to get finalized. But if you really look at it, this is going to be a big massive exercise where the companies need to actually do an evaluation of the internal control at a design level, whether it is operating effectively, they have to do an OE testing and they need to satisfy themselves the internal controls are effective. Then as auditors, auditors need to comment about the effectiveness of the internal control separately in their report. So this again is going, as you said, it is going to open another Pandora's box. So it is not only a comment on the financial statements and the transaction, but also on the internal controls which we are not used to it. Probably in the western world, yes, uh, whoever uh, has got SOX reporting requirement, this is something which is quite common. But in India, this is going to have a significant impact. This is not like CARO. In fact, one of the things which I wanted to clarify is, many people ask whether is it similar to CARO. CARO internal control is having a very, very limited scope. This is a pervasive requirement which is going to have a significant effort both on the part of the corporates as well as on the part of the auditors. You have something to say? Uh, actually, uh, you said vanilla cold, uh, maybe they want you to become tequila hot. <laughs> and uh, with respect to that uh, revision, for the financial statements, uh, the auditor appointments, remuneration fixation is part of the act. But with respect to revision of financial statement, uh, uh, there is a, the rules stipulate uh, that the auditor has to re-audit the revised financial statement, but nowhere even the rule stipulates uh, the condition or the payment of uh, auditor's fee there. Right. It is not there. It is not there. Hopefully, MCA will come up with some clarification. No, guidance note will come. Yeah. Okay. The other one is in terms of direct reporting on fraud. This is again another significant uh, uh, reporting requirement on the part of the auditors where if he identifies a fraud that has to be reported directly. So, I mean the legal protection, confidentiality, whatever they had, everything has been lifted. Now, the moment there is a fraud that has to be reported. Fortunately, in the rules, there is some threshold that has been given. Uh, we have to wait and watch in terms of how it shapes up. It is not talking about because fraud could be anything. Even if, let us say, I think somebody is defrauding 10 rupees. Uh, he is claiming excessively in the voucher, that is also a fraud, right? So, whether are you going to get into all this? So, fortunately, now the rules talk about it is material fraud and what is material fraud? They have given a number to it. As of now, it talks about 2 percent of the net profits and 5 percent of the revenue. So, probably to that extent, there is a threshold available for what is, ident what is fraud and beyond that, one has to report. And actually, I, I believe maybe to add to the speaker, the word is reason to believe. Yeah, reason, to believe. reason to believe. I think uh, the documentation part of it uh, plays a matter for the auditor to conclude that there is a fraud. Absolutely. In fact, now this is going to actually change the focus of the audit. 
So now, if you look at the toil accounting standards, is something which we have been dealing with day in and day out. That's something one can do. But there are several new horizons that are, that has been opened up, and uh, the, the focus will change. So already, let's say, if you are all going through quite a lot of grill, then now you you have to get ready for having an excessive grill because your auditors will be going through a, an enormous, probably a super grill by somebody else. That is something which which is happening. So now, unfortunately, the society has become litigious where you have to demonstrate what you have done. Those were the days where you, you say something, no, I have done it. People will believe. Now, you need to demonstrate why you have done something, why you have not done something. So, then the documentation requirements get increased. In fact, just to kind of share with you, in the US currently, the requirement, the auditing standard, there is a new auditing standard on what should be reported to the audit committee. The new requirement is, if the company has taken a position with respect to any of the complex accounting positions uh, with respect to let's say structuring or maybe tax structuring or whatever they have done, if auditors have formed an opinion accepting that, that has to be reported to the audit committee along with the reasoning as to why the management's assessment of this structuring is acceptable. In addition, they also have to share what are the views of the engagement team and they also as you know I think audit firms are required to have a quality control you know whether is there any disagreement within the team that needs to be shared with the audit committees that is the extent of reporting requirement that runs now. So now this is just to kind of give you an overview on the auditing standards moving on to NFRA very broadly this is going to be like a, uh, probably I think uh, just to kind of summarize whether uh, somebody was saying, is it going to be like a PCOB of the US? As all of you are aware, the world's draconian regulator, auditing regulator as of now is PCOB, where they can kind of literally kind of verify any accounting records of auditors and they have powers and they can uh, issue orders for the purpose of uh, reissuing opinions and they, they could do anything that they want to. And if you take UK, UK there is an FRC, FRC, they have Public Accounting Oversight Board. They also have similar powers where they can issue orders for the purpose of after doing the inspection and all this. If they believe something needs to be corrected, they can actually kind of uh, instruct the auditors to reissue the opinion. So, NFRA is probably going to become another PCOB. One interesting thing which is, which is emerging is when the regulators have called out NFRA, they studied the powers of PCOB, SCC, the FRC and then all the powers they summed up and then added to the role of NFRA. Because if you just go back and see, they are not only responsible for formulating and laying down accounting and auditing policies, but they are also responsible for ensuring compliance and in case if there is a non-compliance, they can also penalize. And the good part is it is not only applicable to the auditors, they can take action against any member. So even against the person who, who is the CFO, he is also coming into the net of NFRA. This is something which is very significant. Final thoughts, basic concepts redefined. We have to necessarily kind of relook at the entire thing once again. There are enhanced roles and responsibilities for CFOs and obviously a lot more reporting responsibilities on the part of the auditors. The legal recognition has been given for auditing standards and a lot of global practices have been recognized. Uh, one thing which I wanted to highlight from a global practice, as you know, now the Act says when an auditor has to audit the consolidated financial statement, he, ha he has the power to access the books of accounts of the subsidiaries. This is something which is very, very significant. Huh? As of now in India, the standard on auditing, uh, I mean, let's say with respect to consolidation, which is uh, say 600, that talks about the responsibility of the parent company auditor and the component auditor. That means if for a large company, the parent company auditor has relied on the audit of a component auditor, then he can refer to that in his report and he, he is not responsible for the work done by the component auditor. That is why he, he clearly says, I have relied on the work done by the component auditor. But now, the Act says 
the parent company auditor will have access to the books of accounts of the subsidiaries. So naturally the question is why should he be having access to books of accounts and other things? Then that means act as, ask, expects him to assume responsibilities for the work of the component also. So to that extent there is going to be a conflict between the existing SA 600 and the expectation of the act. This is going to be another uh, debate that is going to come up. For large entities probably this is going to have a big impact. Just imagine um, for an entity like state bank there could be so many component auditors. So obviously the parent company auditor needs to rely on the component auditors. So if he has to assume responsibilities then he, I mean he may not have the bandwidth to do the audit of all those branches. So this is something which is serious and probably some framework will be laid out. Then uh, the